my experience as a former fundamentalist, I don't mean evangelical, I mean fundamentalist, okay? Uh, we had a very legalistic church environment. And it, amazing, the more legalistic a church comes becomes, the more immorality is in that church. It's just, it's, it, believe me, I've, I've seen this principle work many times. Hidden sin in the fundamentalist church. Because there's no way to, to share that. and to, There's no confession. And the churches were perhaps, I'm saying we, if you'll let me, to kind of combine all of us here in this room, which is never wise to do but because we're all different. But in our type of experience in churches today, we likewise have no place of repentance. And it, beyond that, we even go to the point where it's, it's wrong to repent because Jesus repented for you on the cross and all of your sins are gone. You just need to keep in mind that your sins are gone and forget the, the religiosity of repentance. And that, that's a, it's a, a theology that's gaining ground. Like no hell, no repentance. And yet the Bible says... That we minister to those who are weak in their faith in hopes that they would repent and be converted and, be, and come back to the Lord. And we're told to confess our faults or sins. I mean, you can parse it or slice it, but dude, <laughs> sins, faults, either way. We're to confess those one to another, and that will bring healing. We'll have physical healing when you're sick, by confession of sin. Nobody does that today. Yet it's in the book. Just like John 3.16, it's in the book, folks. So we've eliminated the whole concept. And when I had a visitation from the Lord a few years ago, the Lord came to me in, in a dream, and he told me these words, I am going to restore the principles of Charles Finney's revival. And I'm going to reignite and finish what he began, except on a greater scale. So the Lord told me in this encounter that there were principles of revival that needed to be taught. And that uh, when you lead 100,000 people to the Lord in one city, I'll follow your model. Okay? But Rochester, New York was virtually converted. To this day, there's schools, hospitals, and streets named after Charles Finney. Up until the, about 1930, which would be roughly 75 to 100 years, about 75 to 80 years after Finney died, Rochester, New York, was considered the best city in America to live. It was the, I mean, Rochester, New York, bro, like get a fur coat or two. And a lot of snowblowers. It was because of the influence of Finney had endured long after his death. He would have revival meetings in Rochester. Trains would be filled at Penn Station out of New York. Trains would be filled with people to travel hours to be told how wicked they are. <laughs> and, and New York chased him. He, he was a walking carrier of glory. Finney carried such a power and anointing wherever he went. Cities were shaken. Communities turned upside down. Churches like absolutely multiplied in, in 60, 90 days, multiplied in converts. And it was said over 80%, 85% if I, my numbers are correct, of his converts endured 30 years after. That's pretty good. Every revival since Charles Finney can be traced back to that one man's anointing. He was the revivalist of America. Ulysses Grant at his funeral said these words, There has never been a man in America that has changed our nation more to make us a Christian nation. That was the term he used than Charles Gradison Finney. He's the President of the United States said that at his funeral. He was an awakener. 
He carried like Mary the glory of God. The presence, the, he exuded, he was a dispenser of the divine. The, the splendor of God radiated out of him for miles and miles in, in uh, radius. Can you imagine being such a lightning rod of glory that people, what, 30, 40 miles from here? Would that be the D? That would be almost the D, wouldn't it? What are we, about 30 miles? From? Okay, what about the, what about the D getting under the sway of Almighty God, the power of heaven, where people cried out on the streets, stopped their cars, get a kneel on the curbs, weeping, I got to get rid of my sins. I'm feeling the heavenly glory just because Finney was 30, 40 miles down the road. That's the effect he had. And he, there was, he called it his years of burning, which lasted about 15 years. He teamed up with a, a pastor by the name of Charles Nash. Uh, maybe not Charles. I forget his first name. But it was Nash was his last name. And he was known as Father Nash. Father Nash was an intercessor that would make our intercessors look like, I don't know, daffodils. I'm trying to come up with something I could say nice, you know. Father Nash was so anointed in his prayers, first of all, you heard him a half a mile away when he prayed. He pulled heaven down. Finney would go nowhere until Nash had come and broken up the fallow ground with prayer and intercession. So the whole model of interceding before and after a meeting came through Finney. And Father Nash was so anointed Finney would always point to that prayer warrior, his friend, who was going blind, by the way. Nash was going blind and decided to memorize the Bible, and then the Lord healed him. <laughs> so it was like the Lord got him to do something, and then boop, his eyes popped open, and he was fine. Isn't that amazing? He was an amazing man. But when Nash died, Finney hung it up. He said, I I'm going to go be a Bible college president. He went to Oberlin College. And he, he basically quit the evangelistic ministry. Why? Because the generator of glory passed away. But those, during those 15 years of burning, you could not get into his meetings without coming under a power of a heavenly affection. You, you would, I mean, I, I, I'm just, I wasn't there. I'm not that old. But I'm picturing, like, you, you just, you want to get clean. You want to get everything off of you. Every stick tight, stalag might, you know, cling on. You want to get all of it off. Anything dark, morose, anything evil, anything even suspicious of looking like darkness or sin. No part 